from Temple University, this is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. I take pleasure in introducing Mrs. Elizabeth Gray Vining. Mrs. Vining has lived in this area for many years. She was born in Germantown, attended Germantown Friends School and Bryn Mawr College, as well as Drexel Institute. We claim her as a native daughter. Discussion tonight is going to center around five of her children's books. Two are biographies, Penn and young Walter Scott. One takes place in Japan, The Cheerful Heart. Two take place in England at an earlier period, I Will Adventure and Atom of the Road. She won the Newbery Medal for Atom of the Road in 1943, and we are fortunate to have the medal here in the studio tonight. A panel of students from this class in children's literature will join me and the other students in the audience in questioning you. You know that someone on this panel is going to ask you, so I might as well. <laughs> How did you, it come about that you were chosen to be the tutor of, of English for the Crown Prince? Well, that's a, that's a very long story. I'll, I'll try to cut it, cut it short. But in this, uh, it was the Emperor's own idea. The Emperor of Japan himself decided, without consulting uh, his advisors about the Crown Prince's education, that he wanted an American to tutor his son. And uh, there was an American education mission visiting Japan in the spring of 46, and the emperor gave a reception for them. And in the course of the party, he suddenly turned to Dr. Stoddard, who was the head of the mission, and said, can you get me an American to tutor my son, the crown prince? Well, Dr. Stoddard, the next day, met representatives of the editor of the emperor and found out uh, more about what he had in mind. It seemed that he wanted a woman. Uh, he also wanted... A Christian, but not a fanatic. <laughs> and so Dr. Stoddard uh, came back to uh, the United States, charged uh, with finding somebody to send to Japan to tutor the crown prince. I read about it in the newspaper and thought, how very interesting, and, and put it aside, thought no more about it. At the time, I was working for the American Friends Service Committee. I, was, I had planned to uh, resign and... Um, to go up to the writer's colony in Peterborough that summer and work on a novel. In the last day or so, when I was in the office, I was uh, clearing up my desk, and one of the officers of the service committee came into me and said, uh, would you be willing for us to su suggest your name as tutor to the Crown Prince? Well, it seemed to me an absolutely extraordinary idea. I knew nothing about Japan, I knew nothing about royalty, and I, anyhow, I had my plans to write a book. So I said no. And he said, well, go home and think it over over the weekend. So I went home and I thought it over. And these are the things I thought about. That it was an extraordinary thing that after a war so bitterly fought, the Emperor of Japan should want somebody from the conquering country to come and tutor his son. It seemed to me that was something altogether new in the world and something rather hopeful. And in the, then in the second place, the work I had been doing for the American Friends Service Committee, I had been doing for the sake of peace and reconciliation in the world. And I thought, what could be a more amazing chance than for, to work for peace and reconciliation than to go to this occupied country and take ideas of peace and friendship? And so after the weekend, I came back and I said that I couldn't refuse to have my name suggested but that I wouldn't lift a finger to get the job. I felt that it had to come. It had to be destiny tapping me on the shoulder. So the uh, doctor started asked for an interview with me, and he asked me many questions, and I asked him many questions. And in the end, he sent two names to the imperial household of Japan. He thought they should have some responsibility for the final choice. And the word came back, a cable, saying the imperial household has decided upon vining. Repeat, vining. So that's how it happened. 
It seemed to me that uh, you did a great deal more than just that original one hour a week of tutoring for the crown prince that was in the, uh, in, in the agreement. Oh, yes, I did. When, when I first heard about that, that it was to be one hour a week with the crown prince, I thought, go all that distance and for one hour a week. And then I thought, well, after all, you get your toe in the door. <laughs> so I went, and in the end, it was, of course, it was very much more. I taught the, uh, I had the crown prince in private lessons. He came to my house. I taught his class in school. His mother wanted uh, lessons in English. I taught her twice a week. I taught two of his uncles and his three of his sisters and his younger brother. I lectured at Suda College. I had a very, very full schedule. It was far more than one hour a week. Mrs. Barney, excuse me. Uh, the title of that book seems so great, so perfect. Uh, you mentioned that you used that expression in the book towards the latter part of the book. But when and what problems were attendant to choosing that as a title for the book? The, it was the Japanese themselves who gave me that title, actually. Because soon after I got there, I had an interview uh, with the minister of the imperial household. I had been invited, you see, just to teach English. But he said to me, we want you to open windows onto a wider world for our crown prince. And I talked with him a little further about it, and I understood from that that he wanted me uh, to leave the crown prince out of this uh, narrow circle of Japan in which he had grown up and to introduce him uh, to the best of the ideas of the Western world, which is what I tried to do. So in the end, after he learned enough English for us to talk about things like the UN and Shakespeare's Julius Caesar and all kinds of things, uh, we went very much farther than just English lessons. Did you begin this book while you were still in Japan or after you came home? No, I began the book actually after I got home, but um, all the time I was in Japan, I kept very careful notes of the things that I saw and that I did. For the first two years, I sent very full letters home to my sister, did you? and then she joined me. So after that, I kept a very careful journey, journal on a diary. Did you kind of have the idea of writing a book? I knew that probably I would, and before I left Japan, the the uh, emperor himself asked me to write a book about, about it, and also the prime minister, so that I knew that I wasn't doing anything that they wouldn't like. They, they wanted me to write this book. At what to... point did they see the book? Did they not see it they, until... It they didn't see published? it until it was finally published. They, um, they gave me complete freedom. There was no question of censorship. I had already written some things for them about the imperial household and about the crown prince for Japanese magazines in Japan. They, uh, which the imperial household had asked me to write, so that they had some idea of the sort of thing that I would say. They, they weren't taking as much of a chance as it seemed. Also, they knew you were a novelist when they invited you. Yes, they... When they made the selection, they, they chose Mrs. Vining, the author. Yes, they, they did. It was, it was a very interesting thing, and, and very disappointing, I think, to uh, many teachers in the, in the United States, that it was not really a teacher who went to teach the Crown Prince. It was, it was a writer. I had taught, I'd, uh, uh, but not very much. And, but I had done quite a little bit of uh, private tutoring when I first got out of college. But I think they felt that I knew how to uh, express rather big ideas in simple language. How old was the crown prince? When I first went there, he was 11 going on 12. And when oh, I was the same age. The same age, yes. <laughs> oh, no, excuse me, he was 12 going on 13. Oh, he was 12 when I first got there, he, but he seemed younger at that time. He was a very chubby little boy. And then by the time I left, he was almost 17. Very, very much of a young man, poised and confident and charming. Were you not invited to the wedding? Oh, yes, indeed I was. I was the only, I was the only foreigner at the wedding. What an honor for you. Oh, and has he ever visited you in yes, this country? Yes, he has visited me. I lived after I first came back. For eight years, I lived in a little house on, on Mount Airy Avenue in Germantown, or Mount Airy between Germantown and Chestnut Hill, a little, one of those little old houses, very small. And the Crown Prince, on his way home from um, uh, representing his father at the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II, spent a month in this country. And they indicated to me that uh, he would be more comfortable in my house than he would anywhere else, so that he came for three days to my little house. And this was contrary to a State Department ruling. The State Department says that visiting royalty shall visit, uh, shall stay only in hotels and clubs because they're easier to guard. But they made, in this case, the case of the Crown Prince, they made two exceptions at both ends of the financial scale. They allowed him to visit me, 
and they allowed him to visit the Rockefeller Ranch in Wyoming. <laughs> he spent three days in each place, and he was perfectly delightful. Delightful visitor. Uh, do you have any other questions, members of the panel, about the period uh, concerning Japan? Uh, yes. Just Excuse me. Uh, Mrs. Vining, many of us have a background in education, and I think I would be interested to know, in teaching English, as you did uh, to the Crown Prince, was there one particular area that was more difficult, um, grammar or syntax of that sort that you would Yeah, you see, I, did, I didn't have to teach grammar. I was teaching conversation, which is, uh, I think, uh, absolutely... A green teacher such as I was couldn't go in and teach grammar, but he had he had Japanese teachers teaching him English grammar. But what I what I was doing uh, was to get him was to get him to, to speak English. And in the beginning, of course, it was very difficult because uh, all he could all he knew when I first went there was he could say I am sitting down, I am standing up, I am walking to the window. But he couldn't do any of those things in the past or the future. And so it was a question of which I taught entirely in English, and it was a question of of uh, leading him to guess what words mean, and to try them out. I drew pictures on the board. I uh, pointed to pictures in, in books. I got up and acted things out. And I can remember there was a the time when I was um, in one, one of the early lessons, there was a very uh, formal chamberlain sitting in the room, all dressed in striped pants and, and morning coat. And there was a representative of the Empress there, a very grand Japanese grand dame, very, very formal. And the difference between jump and hop came up, and I got up and showed the prince what was the difference between jump and hop. All these dignified Japanese looked on without cracking a smile. But there were many interesting problems, but I think that was one thing. I, I had to improvise all the time. We did a great deal of games. And um, I didn't have any preconceived ideas at all. The children's book that grew out of that period is called The Cheerful Heart. And I've benefited a great deal from hearing you as you analyze the theme of some of your books. What do you consider to be the theme of The Cheerful Heart? Well, the theme of The Cheerful Heart is that it's, it's loving that makes one happy. Uh, I don't... I don't write morals into my children's books at all. I, I, I don't write down to children ever. And I think if you put an obvious moral in, that would be writing down. Uh, but I think always that when a child finishes with a book, if it's, if it's a worthwhile book, uh, there's some residue left, something, something that he feels that he takes away with him from that book. Uh, it may be something it's very simple. It might be that, it's, that uh, life is good and that one should live it to the full. In the case of the cheerful heart, it was uh, that uh, this little girl told me was it was it had a cheerful. They, they said about it that she had a cheerful heart, and her heart was cheerful because she was a loving, a loving little girl. You have an interesting way, without the use of a glossary, of making equivalences understood for United States children. For example, I noticed in the cheerful heart you said uh, that an egg was very expensive when the mother wanted to make a cake. You said that an egg cost 15 yen and that at that time a pair of leather shoes could be bought for 15 yen. Uh, what other devices do you use for making terminology understood? That is, that, I'm interested that, interested that you bring that up because I've, I've been working on that all, all my life. When I wrote uh, Young Walter Scott, which was one of my early books, there are a great many Scottish words that I felt American children wouldn't understand. I, I haven't any one device, but I just take care, after I've used the word, to slip in some little phrase that explains it, mm -hmm. that any child can put two and two together and figure out what it means. When you wrote Atom of a Rose, your Newbery winner, did you originally start with the purpose of writing about a minstrel son? No, I didn't. But I, I started uh, with the idea of of making a collection of the tales uh, that the minstrels told in the 13th century, the metrical romances of the Middle Ages, which I had studied in college and was very much interested in. And I was planning uh, to make my own translations and retelling of them, and then to link the stories together with a, in a little frame of a minstrel and his son who would go about the roads of, of England 
uh, telling one kind of story in a manor house and another kind of story in a castle, another kind of story in an inn, and so on. And then suddenly, uh, this minstrel boy uh, came into my mind so clearly, he simply walked in and took possession of it. I saw the striped surcoat that he wore, I saw the little, the little harp that he carried on his arm, his, his red hair and his freckles, and the dog at his heels. And then the, uh, the adventures that he would have uh, simply attached themselves to him. And before long, he had taken over the, the book. And I never did write my collection of the minstrel's tales. You do such careful research. Uh, do you always subordinate research to plot? It's absolutely essential to subordinate research to the story. You have to do your research and live with it and assimilate it and then write your story out of this knowledge as of, of the life that's passed as if it had happened to you. I, I think perhaps I have a, uh, I think if I have any, if I can claim any particular gift, I do think I have a gift for imagining myself back in another age and for feeling very much as if I really lived there. When I was working on my bi biography of Penn, I was, I was in England in 1937, and I was living on two lev three levels then. I was living in modern England, which was the year of the coronation, and I was living in 17th century England with Penn, and then I was living back in, in the England of the Middle Ages. And uh, it, was, it was quite interesting to go from one to the other, but I felt very much at home in all three. Uh, tell us why you use gray with children's books and vining with adult books as your author. Well, before I'm... Elizabeth Janet Gray was my maiden name. And before I was married, I had already published four books. So that I thought I might just as well go on uh, with that name. And, and then I had another thought. was that My husband was uh, an associate director of the Extension Division at the University of North Carolina. And I was writing children's books. And I thought, well, I might write something might, that might embarrass him at the university. So I'll just keep my name Elizabeth Gray. Fine. Elizabeth Janet Gray. And then when I went to Japan, of course... There wasn't a newspaper in this country or in a good many other countries that didn't have Elizabeth Gray vining splashed all over it. So that, um, that naturally was the book under, uh, the name under which I wrote Windows for the Crown Prince. And then after that, I decided that I would keep my adult books under the name Elizabeth Gray vining and my children's books, which I had quite a list by that time, under the name Elizabeth Janet Gray. Does the same house publish both groups? No, Viking Press publishes the children's books and, and <coughs> Lippincott publishes the adult books. In order to get your works first established with the public, did you have to use an agent? No, I didn't. I simply sent my manuscript off to a publisher. In fact, I sent it to two publishers. The first one turned it down, and the second one accepted it. Which one was that? Which manuscript? Uh, this was a book called Meredith's Anne. It was my first book. I'm sure you didn't have that trouble with your uh, Japanese stories. Well, I've never, had any, I've never had any trouble since that first book. Weren't they waiting for you to write something after you had... Oh, the Japanese book. Oh, my goodness, yes. Uh, what I did when, uh, for Windows, I had an agent to sort out the applicants for the book. <laughs> oh. Signing as an author of fact and fiction books, do you find one or the other more rewarding to write? No, I enjoy writing both of them. I rather like to, to alternate. Not, it seems not definitely all the eight, but uh, maybe one, two or three, one, and then, then write the other. Do you find one more difficult to write than the other? No, no, I, I don't. But I'm just, just some things, some ideas that come to me seem to, uh, should, be, should be expressed in, uh, in factual books, and others uh, express themselves through, through fiction. And sometimes there's a mixture of both. Now, one of my adult novels is... Um, a biographical novel about uh, the life of John Donne, the poet. And um, that certainly was a mixture of both, because I, uh, I did an enormous amount of research. I tried to have every detail in it, at, just as it really happened. And I went to a great, great lengths to find out uh, these facts. But there were some places where there were gaps in the facts, and there I allowed my imagination to, to uh, fill in what I thought would be, would be true uh, to his character and to the character of the other people involved and also to the times and the thought of the times. That is the most difficult thing about writing about the past, is to get the climate of thought of the past. It's easy enough to pick up costume, customs, uh, events, 
Uh, but people thought differently, entirely differently in a past period from the way they think now. And it's the hardest thing not only to pick up the thought and make it, express it in your book, but to make modern people accept it. And an example of this is the, the uh, poet Dunn in Take Heed of Loving Me. Uh, he married this lovely young girl, ran away, loped with her, and it, 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 uh, he, he was ruined as a result for many years. And they had <clears throat> 13 children, and she died of the 13th. Uh, well, in those days, uh, children were God's gift. You were, you were grateful for it. So many children died that if, if you had 13, you could probably raise six of them or five of them. But many modern people have written and scolded me because of John Dunn's having, letting, allowing uh, his darling wife, Anne, uh, to have so many children. It's a difference in thought, you see. It's a totally different time of thought about that. Could we return to your Newbery winner? Because I'm not sure everyone who's read it has seen the theme that you started out with, and I benefited from hearing you express it. What do you see as the theme of Adam of the Road? Uh, the theme of Adam of the Road is that each one of us has a talent, uh, which is ours uh, to develop and to use. And if we don't use it, it rusts. Uh, this is, is born out in, in Adam. Uh, he, uh, he loses his dog, and in trying to find his dog, he loses his, he's separated from his father. And he goes up and down the roads of England hunting for his dog and his father. He's a very appealing, attractive youngster, and many people want to help him along his way. And in helping him, they all want to make him something that he isn't. The parish priest wants to make him a parish priest. He, somebody else wants to make him a, a scholar. Uh, the farmer uh, with whom he stayed for some time uh, wants, wants him to stay and be a farmer. Uh, and in the course of the story, he, di he discovers that what he really is is a minstrel, and this is what he is supposed to do in his life. I want to tell you that one of my favorite works is your book called Pen. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw in the beginning portion the great contrast between father and son. Yet on the deathbed, his father uh, encourages Penn to follow his conscience. Uh, can you tell me uh, how you interpret these last words of Master Penn Sr.? Well, of course, the, the, these two, the father and son, were very much alike. That's why there was so much conflict between them. And uh, the father, in the end, his last words to his son were, uh, live in love. But I think he, he had come to recognize uh, the son's uh, real dedication, real commitment uh, to this religion, this Quakerism, which he had taken up and which was so offensive to the father. The thing that made me want to write about, about William Penn was not simply my, my Quaker interest, uh, but the, um, the story that I read about Penn as a young man in the tower. Uh, he was at odds with his father. He'd been, his father had planned to make a, an ambassador of him. He put all, and give him every possible advantage. He put all this aside to become a Quaker, a time when Quakers were totally despised. He had written the book about his new religion, uh, which he omitted to have licensed by the Bishop of London, and so he landed in the Tower of London, which is not a happy place to land. He was well aware of all the people that had been beheaded there. And after he'd been there for some months, uh, they sent word to him that if he would recant this book that he had written, he might come out. Otherwise, uh, he, uh, they, he could stay there the rest of his life. And he sent back word, My prison shall be my grave before I will budge a jot, for I owe my conscience to no mortal man. And that seemed to me so utterly thrilling and magnificent uh, that I, I wanted to write a book about it. Did most of your background material for this book come through your Quaker affiliations, or? Well, this this had this had to be researched. Uh, I did a great deal of work in the historical library of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. I also went to England and did and did work there. And I read all of Penn's books, which I may say was something to, to write. <laughs> <laughs> great deal of it was very boring indeed. <laughs> Some of it was beautiful and quite thrilling, uh, but. There were gold nuggets here and there. So that uh, you, the, the, what the Quaker background gives you is a, is a sympathy and an interest and an openness in that direction. But the actual facts and the actual work, you have to dig out of secular libraries. How long does it take you to write a book on the whole? Depends on the book. 
Now, I wrote a biography of Rufus Jones, which it took me three years to write. Uh, but um, usually, with the children's books, uh, after I've done any research that has to be done, it's about like having any other baby. <laughs> it starts very slowly, and nine months later, there's a tremendous burst of labor, and you finish the book. <laughs> that's pretty fast, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. But, uh, that's, that, is, that is after <coughs> the research is done and the thinking. And that's a stage that people never uh, so seldom seem to be aware of. And that is that after you've got your research done, after you've got your plot thoroughly in mind, uh, then you mull over the book for quite a long time. You carry it around with you in your mind. And when you're, when you're waiting for trains or when you're stopped at a traffic light or uh, before a uh, curtain goes up at the theater, uh, you're thinking about your characters. They're, they're living with you all this time. And it isn't until you've done all this thinking that you're ready to write. And then it goes fairly fast. Well, you're right, working on two things now, your autobiography and your children's book. I put the, I put the children's book aside to do oh, the autobiography. You do just one at a time all the time. I do all the time, but I have an idea in my head of what's going to be next. Mm -hmm. Do you do much rewriting after the first draft? I do the first draft, and um, then ordinarily there isn't a great deal of rewriting. Oh, it's mostly cutting, because I think anything can be improved by, by cutting and condensing. Uh, with uh, my book on Rufus Jones, I rewrote one chapter six times. I want to thank you very, very much, Mrs. Vining and members of the panel, for this opportunity to hear something about your tremendous work. Well, you've been wonderful, isn't you? Thank you.